Hi, I'm Dr. Wendy. I work in Hadassah University Teaching Hospital as a pain, uh, pain specialist. And I want to talk to you today about ergonomics and posture and how faulty ergonomics and posture can cause and perpetuate so many of our musculoskeletal disorders. The actual lecture outline, I'll first start with some ergonomic examples, many negative ones. I'll talk about posture and the way we do things and bring some literature as to, to prove why poorly applied ergonomics causes so, much, so many problems. I'll talk about the physics of it a little bit and then I'll bring, some rec bring recommendations as to how we should apply ergonomics healthily and positively to our life. The telephone has become so much part of our lives. We are basically addicted to it. We carry it around all the time. We can't spend any time away from it. And in our daily lives of today's society, we are so rushed and pressured and we want to spend, we want to get as much done in as little time as possible and do as, as many things at the same time. But many of us want to talk on the phone when still both hands are busy. So we end up holding the phone like this between our shoulders and our heads. And when we do this for prolonged periods of time, this causes a lot of strain on the neck muscles here and the shoulder muscles. So it's not surprising that people can develop neck pain and shoulder pain, and especially secretaries who spend hours at, at their desks while answering phones and doing working on the computer at the same time, like this, are vulnerable to suffer from neck and shoulder pain. Dentists, at least until five, ten years ago, are notorious for suffering from neck pain due to the adoption of faulty non-neutral non postures for lengthy periods of time. You can see in, the, in both pictures here how they often get into contorted and twisted positions with their body bent to one side and the neck bent to the other side. And in order to hold themselves in a position like that and remain stable, and do very, um, perform work that has to be so accurate, you ha the, the body has to be so tense, the muscles have to be tense to support that body in, in that position for a long time. And this is why dentists are, are notorious for suffering for, from so much neck pain. We sit at the computer so engrossed in the screen with our head forwards like this and our neck is often hyperextended. But the neck and the thoracic spine de develop a C-shaped spine. And this, again, puts a lot of stretch, stretch and stress on the ligaments and the muscles of the upper, upper and lower back. And even when you're sitting on a couch and you want to just talk to friends or watch TV, we are, many of us are lazy and we just sit slouched like that and we adopt this C-shaped spine. Again, the previous picture of the dentist, instead of standing in this contorted position for prolonged periods of time, it is better to adopt a position where, as in the picture on the right, with the surgeon, I haven't got a picture of a, of a dentist using a microscope, as is often done today. But the same principle applies, to be able to stand or sit with a back straight and to <coughs> and to work with the elbows in comfortable position, preferably elbows flexed at 90 degrees, and work comfortably. This is, leads to much less musculoskeletal disorders. As I said before, working next to the computer, we're so engrossed in looking at the computer. And here you can see me in various positions. But the first one on the left depicts a typical computer worker or anyone working with a computer with his head forward and his upper neck is hyperextended, his back is in a thoracic kyphosis, he's in a C-shaped spine and the field of vision is not perfect. The field of vision should go from, from, an, from approximately almost horizontal level to about five degrees positively to a minus 
30 degrees. And here I'm sitting with a field of vision of plus 15 to minus 15 degrees. In the picture on the right, on both pictures on the right, you can see a more ideal position. Ideally, the ear should be aligned with the shoulders, just basically above the shoulders. I have a normal uh, cervical lordosis and a small, slight thoracic kyphosis, which is quite healthy. I'm sitting with the back support, which means that I have, don't have my back muscles, back extensors don't have to work so hard. And my field of vision is, is good in that my, um, my eyes are looking at a, at a field of view that is from about four to five degrees positive to minus 30 degrees. So in the next slide, we see a picture of one of these chairs in which we have no back support, but the seat is actually on an angle. And so the weight is on the buttocks and the support for the knees is at an angle such as to stop us slipping off the chair. And this actually leads to the person to sit with pretty much an autom automatically straight back in a comfortable post posture without really needing to recruit many extent the use of extensive muscles all the time. It just comes more or less automatically and is actually quite comfortable to sit on. Here's a picture of me working on doing a procedure under ultrasound. And you can see like so many of us, if we don't apply ergonomic principles and we haven't adjusted the position of the ultrasound machine and the bed near the ultrasound, then we're all crunched up, our necks hyperextended, the body is in a C shape, the spine is C shaped, the legs are, are the hips and the knees are slightly flexed, which means that I have to use a lot of energy and I'm muscle, the body is very tense just to support myself in that position for a lengthy amount of time so that I can do this, the work that I have to do in a very precise and exact manner. The correct way to do that is as in the right hand side picture is to be able to work comfortably with the elbows more or less at 90 degrees, the head straight, aligned, a minimal, minimally bent back and looking straight at the ultrasound screen and I can see exactly what I'm doing on the ultrasound without having to look down on my, on my, um, and my hands all the time. This is actually very comfortable and you can do this for prolonged periods of time. So what's ergonomics? So ergonomics is defined as the science that uses the law of physics to explain motion of the body segments and the forces that act on them during normal daily activities. So if we are, the application of these principles maximizes performance and conserves energy and prevents skeletal disorders in industry. And it's really important to apply these ergonomics because faulty ergonomics are what can poten potentially precipitate and perpetuate muscular skeletal disorders. So if we want to achieve long-term results when we're treating muscular skeletal disorders, if we don't address these ergonomic principles and we don't address these perpetuating factors, we're unlikely to achieve long-term results. So we have to address posture, we have to address the work environment, and we have to address sleep posture, which is so much neglected. So I want to uh, bring some literature on ergonomics and the effect of poorly applied ergonomics on the prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders. And the first study I want to quote is from the Journal of American College of Surgery, published in April 2020. The impact of procedure type, case duration, and adjunctive equipment on surgeon of intraoperative musculoskeletal discomfort. And what was found was that surgeons from all fields, from all different sorts of specialties of surgery, suffered from a lot of musculoskeletal pain, 
And those who performed longer surgeries suffered from a higher prevalence than, than their colleagues who performed uh, shorter surgeries, including laparoscopy. And this included back pain and neck pain in particular. Another study on neurologists published in February 2020 Ergonomics and musculoskeletal symptoms in surgeons performing endoscopic procedures for benign prostatic hyperplasia. And what they found was that, again, urologists very rarely applied urban ergonomic principles to their work. And uh, they suffered particularly from a lot of neck pain and back pain. 69% of the urologists in this study suffered from uh, musculoskeletal pain of which 64% suffered from neck pain, 57% suffered from back pain, 48% suffered from shoulder pain, and lower prevalences suffered from elbow and hand pain. In a study published in the Workplace Health uh, in 2019, prevalence of musculoskeletal pain in dental workers in Slovenia show that 80% of the 82% of the dentists in this study suffered from musculoskeletal pain, including neck, back, and shoulder pain. However, not only uh, the dentists, also the dental technicians and the dental assistants suffered from pain. And this is also because they're notoriously known for working in very all sorts of contorted positions, as I depicted earlier in the lecture. In, an, in the International Journal of Occupational Medical Environment Health, Environmental Health in 2018, a study uh, was published, Determination of Pain in Musculoskeletal System Reported by Office Workers and the Pain Risk Factors, showed that people who sit for prolonged periods without a break and those who sit with insufficient back support um, suffer from... Um, suffer from more prolonged uh, pain, more uh, back and neck pain in particular. In the, in the Journal of Surgical Oncology, 2018, a study called Ergonomics in Microsurgery showed that people who do a lot of microsurgery suffer tremendously from neck pain in particular more than their colleagues. And this is because Microsurgeons in particular have to stand for prolonged periods of time in a static posture without moving anything in order to be very precise in their work. And th this puts an extra amount of stress on the musculoskeletal system. In Physical Therapy 2018, um, a crossover randomized controlled trial called Global postural education with, in patients with chronic nonspecific pain, a crossover analysis of randomized control trial, showed that they studied uh, patients with neck pain and they divided them into two groups, one with, that got uh, a treatment of global postural re-education and the other with manual therapy. And then they did a crossover. And what they found was that though the pain scores were not statistically different, the patients that got treatment with the postural re-education had a significantly lower disability and significantly increased range of neck motion than the other ones in the uh, manual therapy group, and there was, much, there was a much reduced kinesiophobia than the ones in the manual group. And last but not least, I want to quote a study published in Laryngoscope in 2019, Ergonomic Hazards in Otolaryngology. And the otolaryngologists are notorious also for suffering from neck pain because of working for prolonged periods, looking, uh, studying, work, examining uh, the uh, ENT system and operating on it. And I just want to quote a section from the summary of this article. Our data suggests that pain and disability induced by poor ergonomics are widespread among otolaryngology community and confirm that surgeons rarely receive ergonomic training in the surgical context. Additionally, intraoperative observational findings identified that the majority of observed surgeons display poor posture, 
particularly a poor cervical angle and use of ergonomic setups, both of which increase ergonomic risk hazard. So I think that all these studies that are quoted, I think that all these studies that are quoted lend enough support to show that poorly applied ergonomics does cause a hazard and does uh, increase morbidity and uh, of um, mus in musculoskeletal disorders. And I think that it is in incumbent upon us to implement and apply these ergonomic principles in order to reduce the prevalence and the rising prevalence of these musculoskeletal disorders as, and as the associated rising costs. Buckminster Fuller, who was a very international, internationally acclaimed architect, coined the term tensegrity, which is a combination of two concepts, tension and integrity. And this basically he applied to every inanimate and inan animate and inanimate object, that every, every object has a structure on which it is it, it's based. And if you if one side of that structure is weak or tight, then it affects the whole stability of the rest of the structure. And this is basically how our body function, fu functions as well. If we're going to have one side that's contracted or short or spastic and one side that's weak, that we're not going to function effectively. So what's the ideal posture? We have here an almost ideal posture. It's not quite. The, ideally, the ears should go above the uh, shoulders. And the center of gravity should go from the ear to the shoulders, through the elbows, down through the greater trochanters, just to the front of the knees and in front of the ankles. And here is a picture of a swayback posture. But how does that affect us? Why is it so pathological? And he's obviously got a thoracic kyphosis, which is very extreme. But you can quite visualize that the muscles and the ligaments of the, lumbar, of the thoracic, thoracolumbar spine are going to be stretched and weak. And so we want to be uh, strengthen it. As, as part of the treatment, we will recommend strengthening these muscles, the extensor muscles of the, of the back. On the other hand, the rectus abdominis is short and pulling that person down. So we want to be able to stretch that muscle, stretch the rectus abdominis muscle. And the main muscle that is responsible for causing an ant anterior pelvic tilt or a low dosis is the iliopsoas. So this is obviously weak here. So one of the injections, one of the so one of the exercises that we will prescribe is to strengthen the iliopsoas muscle. And if this continues too long, then you can see here that the hip is in a slight extension, which will cause wear and tear on the anterior surface of the uh, femoral cartilage. The military posture is quite the opposite. You can see that this person is standing super straight, with a hypolodosis, his ears are straight on top of his shoulder. However, the anterior pelvic tilt is, is too strong, and this is caused partly by a, a short dominant iliopsoas. So as one of our exercises, we would want to stretch that muscle. On the other hand, we will want to strengthen the abdominal muscles, and not just the rectus abdominis, but all four muscles. And we would want to also strengthen the glutei, gluteal muscles, which also cause, uh, lend to support of the hips, but also uh, extend the hips. What are the risk factors for work-related musculoskeletal disorders? And there's several. I'm talking about a lot of, you can particularly, here is the example of a factory where the factory workers are very vulnerable to repetitive strain, repetitive injuries 
because they do in, with them repetitively hundreds or thousands of times a day. So there's posture, repetition, the force magnitude, mechanical compression, the duration of each procedure, how long it takes, the vibration, if there's any vibration, and the temperature. If someone works in cold conditions, they are more vulnerable to repetitive strain injury. So if, let's say, you have someone who's going to be painting ceilings constantly doing this the whole time, then if you're not, not giving those tendons, those shoulder tendons, time to recuperate, then they're going to be much more vulnerable to, to de degeneration. So just a few words about, ergon about keyboards and mice that we use for them computers. So here's just a normal, regular keyboard that we use. And notice that when I use this, my hands must be in, ex wrists must be in extension. And for some reason, a lot of people not only do that, but they accentuate their extension by uplifting these tabs here, which puts their wrist into even more extension. So this, if we do this constantly, is going to put a lot of stress on our extensor tendons here and lead to a tennis elbow or a lateral epicondylitis or an epicondylalgia. The, my, the mouse also, if we're holding the mouse like this, our wrist is an extension, which is not something that we don't want to use for hours upon hours a day. Nakamson did a study in 1966, it's an old study, but on which several ergonomic principles are based. And he measured the pressure within the L3 disc in, dip, in various positions. And he found that if the absolute 100 millimeter mercury is in the standing position, the pressure within the disc increases much more. When, it's, when one bends forward, it increases by 40% and it increases more when you bend down to pick up something. And it increases 400% if when one is going to bend down on the side to pick up something, on the oblique. So this is something that we should take into consideration. When we're bending down on the side to pick something, try and avoid it. Preferably to turn towards the object, bend down our knees and pick it up. Not only because of the disc, but because of the muscles that are recruited become vulnerable to sprain. Not only that, the nutrition of the disc is dependent on a pumping action. There's no blood supply to the disc. There's no oxygen coming into the disc or glucose or any nutrients unless we sort of move around and pump the fluid within there. And in addition, the pumping action increases that, changes the hydrostatic pressures within the, within the disc and increase the proteoglycan production, which the younger people have. So if we're going to move around and pump our discs up with more nutrition and more fluid, then we can try theoretically and keep our discs young. This is a study done on measuring the pressure within the erector spinae muscles. And they found that if you're holding a weight close to you, there's a certain, that's more than not holding a weight at all. But if you're holding, going to hold that weight further away from you, then that increases the pressure in the erector spinae muscles. And if you want to pick up something, if you're going to bend down and pick up something, you can see that the pressure increases fourfold. But if you're going to pick up that muscle, that weight from a distance from you, then that pressure within the erector spinae muscle increases even more because it has to work so much harder. And why is this? Because if you hold, a, and I just want all of you, when you're watching this, I want you to stop, stop this video for a second, in a, in a, in a, if, in a second. But I want you to take a, a book, look for a book that weighs about two kilos, let's say, and hold it close to you. And then I want you to take that book and hold it away from you. And what feels heavier? 
So the body has to work a lot harder to hold that weight away from you. And as far as the body is concerned, if the, body, if the book is, let's say, four times the distance, then as far as the muscles are concerned that have to hold this, this book weighs four times the amount. So the weight that we feel that we have to, we feel that, that, that weighs is proportional to the distance between the body and the, dis, the place of the book, position of the book. So when we sit with a C-shaped posture and our head forwards, think of what we're doing to our spine and all those muscles that have to support that head. So if we're going to be holding our head forward, then our muscles have to work so much harder to support that weight. And we do this for hours upon hours a day without, thinking, without blinking an eyelid to think about it. And then we wonder why that person has, is so vulnerable to develop neck pain and shoulder pain. So this is something that we must address. Okay, so what are the recommendations? I want to start, before I actually start recommending, just to take a look, look at this photo. This is a photo of my son when he was eight months old. This was 35 years ago. But you can see this is an eight-month-old baby sitting straight, sitting perfectly straight. And this is how God made him to sit. He's not lazy, he hasn't become lazy yet. And this is how babies sit. This is a picture of his daughter 24 years later. She's nine months old here. And you can see how even though she's turning her head, her back is totally straight. And this is a picture of the same daughter at the age of two. She is ma making bread, but you can see how she's sitting so straight. So we can learn from our toddlers and our babies how to sit and how not to, become, not to be lazy. So recommendation number one, try and adopt the idea, and I can adopt it myself, of having our head above our shoulders, our ears above our shoulders. It's not easy. Ideal sitting, you want to sit. Eyes looking straight ahead, ears above our shoulders. Preferably with some sort of back support so our extensor muscles don't have to work too hard. Our hips flex to 90 degrees and our knees flex to 90 degrees and our feet are supported on the floor and if they can't reach to put them on some sort of footstool. Number three, if we want to pre prevent eye fatigue and sometimes headaches, to look at the distance of three to four meters every 20 minutes, 20 minutes or so. And this is relatively easy for us practitioners, medical practitioners, because we can look at our patients as they walk in the room. We can say hello to our secretaries. We can get up and examine our patients. So we have an excuse to get up and walk around and move and mobilize and give a rest to our eyes. When we look at the computer, this is number, uh, recommendation number four. When we look at the computer, the field of vision should be from five degrees positive to minus 30 degrees. And five, as I mentioned a, couple of, a minute ago, to move around at regular intervals. We want to pump those discs and oxygenate them and, and loosen up the muscles. The field of vision, we can see, if I look straight ahead, I can see to plus 50 degrees to minus 70 degrees. But it would cause a lot of eye strain if I have to focus on those regions on the top and bottom levels for prolonged periods of time. The comfortable region is from plus 5 to minus 30. And that's where most of our field of work has to be. Six. We, shouldn't, we should work in neutral positions most of the time. We shouldn't have to get into all sorts of contorted positions so that we should be comfortable, relaxed. We shouldn't have to stress our bodies to hold ourselves in a, in a position that's awkward. 
Seven, ergonomic, ergonomic keyboards. And I'm just bringing two ergonomic keyboards here. This is the one that I usually use. And you can see that the wrists are resting on here. And I'm not in a position of wrist extension here. And I can sort of type quite happily along here without the wrist being in extension. Here's another keyboard. You can see this sort of depression here for the fingers. So I'm resting my palms here, my wrist pads here, and I'm just sort of typing away like this. So that, again, my wrists are not in extension. And this is also actually very com com comfortable to work with. It takes a bit of practice to get used to typing because everything's a bit of a, a different angle. But it actually is also very comfortable once you, get, once you get used to it. And here's the mouse that I work with. You can see, as I've got in the picture on the right-hand side, that... Again, my wrist is not an extension. It's not, I'm not holding the mouse like this, like a normal mouse, but my hand is like this, and I can roll the, use this roller quite comfortably, and the hand is in a perfect, perfectly neutral position. So this is an ergonomic mouse that I work with. This is another ergonomic mouse that I have that I sometimes use. You can see that the wrist is not an extension. It's basically in a neutral position. And I'm using my, my thumb to press as, the, as, as a right and a left click. And I can move that around. So that's about ergonomic mice and keyboards. If you don't have an ergonomic uh, mouse, then there are various wrist pads that can elevate the wrist pad here so that the fingers sort of go down a little bit and there are various um, adaptations to this or there's a wrist pad that you can have that's slightly on an angle that will put your wrist also at an angle which is also quite okay. As I said in the lecture the closer the closer you are to the object you want to lift then the less you strain your muscles to lift it up. So I'm approximating myself to, to this object that I want to lift. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be a heavy object to cause strain, so you should do it properly. I'm going to bend down with my knees and hips. My back is straight. And I'm going to straighten my knees and automatically my, my hips are straightened and then my back is straightening up towards the end. Here's my son who's 18 months old. This is 33 years ago or 34, 34 years ago. But it's interesting to note how an 18 month old toddler knows to bend down with his knees. He knows that if he's going to bend down with his knees straight, his whole center of gravity is going to take him forward and is just going to topple over. So he bends down on his knees and that's how we should also. And last but not least, and I think it may be even the most important, is sleep hygiene. We spend a third of our day sleeping. Some of us wish we could spend a third of our day sleeping. But anyway, if we're going to sleep in a non-neutral position for extended hours, then we're going to suffer, then no wonder we suffer from musculoskeletal pain. And if someone comes to your clinic and, and says, you know, my pain is worse in, during the night or in late hours, early hours of the morning and during the morning and gets better during the day, then ask yourselves, what did he do at night? What, what position did he lie on at night? What was his mat what's his mattress like? What's his pillow like? These questions should come to mind immediately as soon as the person says that his pain is worse in the early hours of the morning or when he wakes up. So if you're going to sleep in your tummy, then you're obviously stretching one side of the muscles and you're compressing the other side. You're stretching the sternomastoid and the, and the upper trapezius on the ipsilateral side, which will also cause a lot of strain and trigger points eventually. And this is likely to develop to, pain, to myofascial pain, to neck pain, to musculoskeletal pain, however you want to, to classify it. 
If you're going to sleep on a side, if you're going to sleep in a fetal position and bring your feet right, right up, and you're going to stretch those back muscles and stretch those ligaments continuously for hours on end. So we want to avoid that also. So we recommend not to sleep on the tummy. If you're going to sleep on the side, to make sure that the body is absolutely level with the head, 180 degrees, so that the pillow fills this gap. And that gap is obviously usually larger in males, so the males will usually require a, a larger pillow, a thicker pillow. And we don't need to fight by these fancy orthopedic pillows. As long as this pillow fills this gap, so you may need one and a half pillows or some sort of something to fit this space. So in summary, I want to stretch the main points that, that in a good posture decreases ligamentous and muscular strain, preventing overstretching. It decreases intradiscal pressure. It reduces stress on the thoracic cervical and shoulder, cervical spine and shoulder girdle. It enables more efficient muscle work and improved mechanical advantage with less muscle fatigue. It provides greater range of motion of the upper body. It provides, sits in diaphragmatic breathing, which I actually didn't discuss. And it reduces the myoelectrictivity in the back, as I mentioned before about the EMG studies, stress, which measured the pressures in different positions. So a good sitting posture and a good standing posture will automatically give rise to a good neck posture. And if we encourage, want to encourage good back posture, we want to encourage the support, some sort of back support, so that the back muscles on the neck don't have to work so hard to sit straight. So basically have a nice stretch, relax, work, work effectively and in a relaxed manner without being tensed up. And thank you for listening. I hope I added something to your knowledge. All the best.